All right, here we go. Today we have Patrick Bet David, founder of Valuetainment, entrepreneur, and minority owner of the New York Yankees. Welcome to Vlad TV. It's great to be here. Long time fan of your channel. Long time fan. Likewise. I watch a lot of your interviews. You know, in fact, like we were talking before, the, you know, before we started, a lot of our interviews came from ideas that you had on your channel, like the Michael Franzese, you know, even Sammy the Bull, and various other people. We you know we look on your channel and like, oh, okay, he did three, four billion views. Okay, I think we could we could probably do pretty well with this guest. You know, so so thank you for being an inspiration of Vlad TV. Anytime, thank you. I, I've watched a lot of your interview. You're a very good interview. When I want to know anything with hip hop, mm. I go through you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. First time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born in Iran. Yes. Okay. And uh, Iran, the Iranian Revolution happened 78, 79? Mm -hmm. You were born in 78. I was. So obviously you were not, you don't remember what happened, but your family had to live through this. Yes. So explain to everyone what the Iran Revolution was exactly. So in 1977, December 31st, Jimmy Carter, who just recently... His uh, wife passed away. Jimmy Carter comes to Iran, and he does a toast with the Shah uh, day before, night uh, before uh, New Year's Eve. And he says, Iran is a very important partner of ours. When he leaves, immediately there is mayhem in Iran, huh. absolute mayhem in Iran. Kissinger's involved. Kissinger's telling the Shah, which he just passed away yesterday, 100 years. Yeah. And Kissinger's saying, you don't have to worry about it. We got your back. Nothing's going to happen. This Khomeini guy from France. I know you've sent him out of the country a couple of times. It's going to be okay. And the Shah is uh, sitting there saying, well, you know, his guys are saying, we got to get rid of Khomeini. You know, we can't have him here. He's a dangerous guy. We got to get rid of him. And the Shah said, we're not going to be doing that. Long story short, a couple events take place. One... Uh, Khomeini's son dies, and he indirectly blames the Shah for him dying. Two, Sinama Rex fire happens in Abadan. Abadan is a peninsula place with a lot of oil. A lot of the oil money is there. And this movie theater with 400 people, if you Google Sinama Rex fire, yeah. 400 people are in this theater, and somebody comes in, locks all the doors, Lights this place up, 400 people burned to death that night. And Khomeini's camp, Hezbollah, say the Shah did it. Right across the street from the theater is a police uh, station from this place. Khomeini's camp says Savak did it. Savak is Iran's MI6, Iran's, you know, CIA. KGB. KGB, exactly. Yeah, secret police. And so they were, they were feared, you know, they were criticized. So whatever Mossad gets, MI6 gets, CIA gets, Savak was getting. Right. And I just want to point out, because I looked up uh, this whole situation as well. At that time, that was the biggest terrorist attack until 9-11 happened. Absolutely. You yes. know, to have hundreds of people die violently yes. in a fire like that from someone that purposely did it was kind of unheard of during that time. That's right. That's right. So, so Khomeini came out and they said, the Shah did this. That's his doing. It's a Savak secret police that did it. And next thing you know, tensions went to the roof. So at this point, millions of people are coming out. At one point, nine million people revolted. This is the biggest revolution ever. Not a coup, nothing like that. It's not like the military turned against them. Mm -hmm. So nine million people revolted. By the way, a year later, not even a year, less than a year later, it was proven that the person that caused the fire wasn't Savak. It was somebody, part of Khomeini's camp, but it's irrelevant at that point. Right. There's two other factors to this that's very important to consider. One... In, in the early 70s, mid-70s, the Shah celebrated the 2,500-year celebration of Iran. And it was the biggest party ever. He invited prime ministers, presidents. He, he brought in best chefs, every kind of food you can think about. They spent tens of millions of dollars. Today's money could have been like a billion dollars they spent on this party. And next thing you know, Khomeini's like, that money is yours. He's taking money from you. That oil money is you. Why would he waste it on a party like this? It's insane. He should have never done this. So that kind of got the whole rich and the poor division that he was kind of going through. And then the tipping point is the following. There's a whole documentary done on this next one I'll tell you about. In 1954, the Shah signed a 25-year oil uh, contract with four countries, with them, which is five. So you got U.S., I want to say Germany, U.K., and I think it's France is the other one. So the Shah is becoming... 1976-1977 interview, when CBS is interviewing the Shah, they call him in the interview. The interview starts like this. 
Many call you the most powerful man in the world. So this is not just one of the most powerful men. CBS called him the most powerful man in the world. And he's starting to become a little bit, you know, like we're going to be that powerful country. So that 25-year contract that was coming up, they knew he was going to control the oil prices. They knew he was going to raise the prices. Apparently, there was a meeting in South or Central America, and they said, we got to figure out a way to get rid of them. UK agreed. US agreed. Everybody agreed. Let's create a coup. Obviously, CIA, MI6, these guys are professionals at doing this. Iran falls. Shah leaves January. Khomeini comes uh, early February, late January. The rest is mayhem. Saddam Hussein attacks. There's a war for 10 years, and everything else just breaks loose. Okay, but uh, Khomeini is a religious leader. He is. Right? So why would the U.S. create a coup for a religious Islamic leader to become head of a country? Because that's not usually a good combination with the U.S. historically. You know how there's a business model for wars? Mm. And there's a business model when the Middle East is in chaos. The, 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 the Middle East being in chaos, a lot of stocks do well. Uh, you can control more. You can pin people against each other. You can play proxy wars. Uh, proxy wars, you know, America's professional in proxy wars, depending on who's leading it at the top. Uh, UK's professional in that. Russia's professional in that today. A lot of people are professionals in that. And they were able to succeed. Here's a crazy thing. When Iran was under Shah's regime for 37 years, the economy grew 423 times. Wow. They went from having a 1% literary rate to 50 plus percent within like a decade or two. He took a bunch of money, put it back into the military. They became the fifth most powerful military in the Middle East. I'm sorry, in the world. And next thing you know, if you and I were rich in the 70s, and we're talking about what we're doing for Christmas to go skiing, you and I may say we're going to Iran because Frank Sinatra's performing in Tehran, Iran, and we'd go to the mountains. People were going to Iran for vacation. There wasn't the chaos that we have today. So it was like Dubai is today. Exactly. The best way to put it, Dubai like it is today. Right. Except water, Caspian Sea, mountains, more things that is not fake. Dubai is a lot of fake because they're using the money. Yeah. Iran is actual history, places you can go to. It's not fabric, like history. You know, museum, I first came to the States, I go to a museum. This place has been here for 120 years. I'm like, well, it's a brand new building. <laughs> In Iran, you go to a place like 2,500 years. Like, wow. Yeah. 2,500 years, yeah. So, and, I, and I recently interviewed the, the crown prince of Iran, mm -hmm. and we had a conversation with him about this, which, uh, you know, this, you asked me the question, question brings that up, uh, makes me think about the conversation I had with him. Okay, so the Iranian revolution happens in 79. You and your family move in 89. Yes. From what I understand, to kind of escape the new regime. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? Khomeini dies, I want to say June 2nd or 3rd of 89. Oh, okay, there we go. When he dies, my mom is panicking because it's mayhem. I was in school, Gulbengian, and I can't find them for a couple hours. There's not like a phone. Here's, where's my kid? We're all running out. And protesting's going on outside. Imagine millions of people outside protesting for Khomeini dying, and they're mourning. It's chaotic. My mom says, we got to take our son out. My dad was waiting for a green card that they applied in 1984, and it wasn't coming. Finally, my mom's like, we're not going to risk this because I was about to turn 12 years old. If I turn 12 years old, I have to serve the military, so... We escaped, we went to Germany, and um, that's where we lived at that refugee camp for a year and a half. Okay, so you go to a refugee camp in, in Germany. Yeah. And you're 11, almost 12? I'm about to turn 11 when we get there. Okay. And you were there for two years? Year and a half. What was that like? You know, I, I, I don't have any negative memories of it. I, it was all positive because as a kid, 10 or 12 years old, uh, we stayed in the city called Erlangen. And I was right outside of a military base. So I was with people from Poland. Um, this is when Yugoslavia, with the whole thing that was going on there, I'm sure you, you know, yeah. being from Ukraine, Yugoslavia, Albanian, you know, they're all there. They're all escaping communism. It's a mess. Um, so I mean, guys named Miodrag, Ana Maria, <laughs> Jan Staff, you know, all Katarina, all these types of names. And But it was a great experience. None of us had money. You know, you'd wake up in the morning, they would put the apple juice in a corner, you would go pick it up and you'd bring, hey, the food is here, you'd go take this other thing. We had a little park on this side, it's like these buildings are living right next to each other. Military base was here, there was a building they were trying to build that they stopped building, so we'd go there, three stories, we'd jump up over the top into the sand. And we'd go over here to the left, there was a street, guy would sell cards, you know, and, you know, small little store here, and then we'd get on the bikes to go to school. Great experience, I have very good memories in Germany, very good. 
experience. We used to go to the swimming pool uh, area, six big swimming pools, and we'd go to the city called Nuremberg, which was like 25 minutes away. But I had a fantastic time in Germany. Okay, and then by 1990 or so, you actually managed to get into the U.S. Mm -hmm. So that was the green card that you guys finally got That was the green card we finally got. November 28, 1990, we came here. Okay, and were you given a U.S. citizenship at that time? No, no? I didn't get U.S. citizenship until a, uh, a month after my ETS date, when I got out of the Army. I got out of the Army June of 99. A week or two weeks later, I became a U.S. citizen. Okay, so for nine years, you were in America with a green card. That's right. I joined the Army with a green card. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I me mean, you were kind of the same boat, because yeah. I was uh, an immigrant kid from the Ukraine. It was the USSR at the time. Mm -hmm. and But I think with us, we got citizenship relatively quickly. No, it took me nine years. Okay. They were a little more worried about me than you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys are living in Glendale, California. Uh, so you get to high school, and you are not a great student. No. 1.8 GPA. 1.8. That's what, uh, that's a C minus? That's a C minus. Yeah. But I got to I love math. Hmm. I would never miss math. I love everything about math, trigonometry, math analysis. I didn't like geometry, but pre-calculus, any of that stuff. I was fascinated. Couldn't stand uh, biology. When I took biology, my teacher's name was Miss Tiffany, and she was amazing. She was so good to us. But uh, it's in the finals, a uh, day to take the finals, and me and Shant are there, and she says, Shant and Patrick, can you please stand up? Yes. Even if you guys get 100% on this test, you're not going to get a D. So there's no need to take the test. <laughs> but come up here. You guys are so funny. I love you guys. She gave us a hug. We walked out shaking hands like we got, you know, free one. And then I left. But you, there was no order in my life. Nobody could tell me what to do. My mother couldn't discipline me anymore. At 14 years old was the last time she hit me. Her arm hurt. I'm like, what are you doing? My dad wasn't there, and my dad uh, never hit me ever. That wasn't his style. So nobody could tell me what to do, and I was just sick of life. I'm like, I'm not going to do well with authority. So this is why I couldn't wait to get out of uh, Glendale, and I went to the Army just, just to get away from everybody. But yeah, but in high school, a, a fun fact for you. Do you know how many days I had uh, I missed in school from ninth grade to senior year? How many days? Zero. Okay, you're, you're going every day. Every day. But you just so were I love doing people. well. <laughs> I love people. I just okay. didn't want to be... You know, I didn't do well with order and, you know, the different story on how many times I went to the principal's office, but I was always there. Okay. And during this time, your family, were they yeah. middle class, poor? Were they, you know, upper middle class? No, no. Full on poor. I mean, Full on poor. My dad worked at a 99 cent store in uh, um, uh, Inglewood off of Manchester, right next to Great Western Forum. If you know that there was a video 2020 there, he worked right there, right across the street. I think it was a KFC or I don't know what it was, but. Um, and my mom, we were on welfare. So we had lunch tickets when I'd go to school, welfare baby, I'd go pick up the, with my uh, mom, we'd go pick up the welfare stuff right next to Rafi's place. It's a movie studio now, it used to be the welfare building. And we'd go, my mom would say, go pick this up for your sister and I at Albertsons and Glendale. I'm like, dude, I don't wanna go pick this stuff up. And then I'd have to use the welfare card or whatever it was. But yeah, no, we were not, I've never lived in a house with a swimming pool. I've never lived in a house, period. I've never lived in an apartment with a swimming pool. I don't even know what that feels like. The most expensive shoes I ever got, I'll tell you what it was. We went to Sports Mart by Glendale Galleria. Okay, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. We go there, all my friends have J's. They're all bragging about whatever shoes they got. I'm a size 10 at the time, size nine at the time, whatever it is. But they have these Sean Kemp's for $29.99 for sale, but it's size 13. I tell my mom, I said, mom, honestly, at this point, I don't give a shit, mom. I need, I need some nice shoes. This is embarrassing. Getting all my stuff from Payless. We bought it. And everyone knew Pat's wearing a shoe four size too big. But guess what? It was camps. Or it was camps. Yeah, you'd have to wear two or three socks. Yeah. 